So, let's pick up where we left off. They will sue us. Similarity. I have no tell enough. It's no surprise that the production team were worried about a potential lawsuit, and so they outright denied any similarities to the Supremes. I know nothing about nothing. Tom Iron, the playwright for Dreamgirls, even stated that, I didn't grow up with the Supremes, I grew up with the Shirelles. Dreamgirls isn't about any one group, it's a cavalcade of black Motown singers. The Shirelles, the Chiffons, Martha and the Vandellas, Little Richard and Stevie Wonder. All the characters are larger than life, but I, I mean... Sure, Jan. I don't remember the Chiffons specifically firing one of their members in 1967 Las Vegas, the same night they decided to change their names and make one of them the star who is potentially sleeping with their produ- Oh wait, we haven't got that far yet. Act 2 of Dream Girls starts in 1972, with Dina and the Dreams being one of the most successful girl groups in US history. This success is actually matched to Diana Ross and the Supremes. They uh, are no doubt probably one of the most popular trios ever anywhere in the world today. Would you welcome, please, the Supremes? But the date is not quite the same, because by 1970, Diana Ross had left the Supremes to start her solo career. Bye! <laughs> Bye! <laughs> However, in 1968, Florence attempted to start up a solo career by signing a contract with ABC. She released two unsuccessful singles and then her album was shelved. She did sing for some prestigious events, however she was dropped from the label by 1970. In Dreamgirls, Effie, who has had a child via Curtis at this point, meaning that her Act 1 illness was pregnancy, revitalises her career through her old manager. Marty, Chris was wrong. Do you know this song? I told you I didn't. We'll see. Well, you are, mister. You are. She references her previous failures at starting again, but is determined to make a change. At the same time, Dina Jones is now married to Curtis Taylor Jr., where he tells her that he only ever loved or had ambition for her success. Diana Ross did have an affair with Barry Gordy Jr. from around 1965 to 1970-ish. I, I don't mean to be gossipy, but I'm only, I'm interested in him and, and as well as you. Was he in love with you? Yeah, I think so. He was? Mm-hmm. I think so. And you didn't, didn't... No, I loved him very much, but not a passionate kind of love, not the kind of love that I've had with my husband's. God is the name of... Hustle. Which resulted in a child, Rhonda Ross Kendrick, in 1971. Before giving birth, Diana married someone else in 1971 who admittedly knew the paternity of Rhonda prior to marrying Diana. In the same year, Florence sued Gordy Berry and Motown for additional royalty payments. She was unsuccessful. In Dreamgirls, Jimmy is fired for refusing to sing ballads anymore, stating that he doesn't want to change from soul to pop because it isn't his style. Cece is left unsatisfied with Curtis's aggressive and calculating ways, and so he seeks out Effie. They reconcile, and he gives her a song to sing that he had previously given to Dina. As this track rises in the charts, Curtis hears it, and resorting to old ways, he drives Paola hard to ensure that Dina is at the top and Effie is at the bottom. What? Well, Effie's got a song on the charts. She recorded one night only. Cece thinks he's making a fool out of me? Them, resulting in Effie starting a lawsuit against Curtis. Dina is unhappy in her marriage to Curtis. She wants to go into acting, but Curtis says no. Likewise, in her autobiography, Secrets of a Sparrow, Diana wrote that Gordy drove her to exhaustion and symptoms of anorexia in 1967. Being with me wasn't that easy, and she let me know that because she got rid of my ass. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and while she didn't leave the Motown label for another 13 years or so, she did pursue acting with her debut film performance playing Billie Holiday in Lady Sings the Blues in 1972. In Dreamgirls, the musical ends with Dina Jones and the Dreams disbanding to follow their own pursuits. Dina is going into acting. She's made a clean sweep, put a new manager on her payroll. For the first time, she produced a TV special. She signed with RCA Records at a reported 15 to 20 million dollars. Laurel wants a break. And as I haven't stopped. And Michelle wants to get married to Cece and start a family. However, by the end of the musical, Curtis and Cece are implied to be arrested for their musical crimes against humanity, so 
I hope Michelle doesn't mind waiting. Effie performs one last time with the Dreams as her song reaches number one on the charts. However, the story is not so fortuitous in real life. Diana Ross leaves the Supremes to start her solo career. The Supremes continue, but do not have a top 20 hit after 1972. And whilst Mary Wilson and Florence Ballard reunited for a few performances in 1974, where Florence played the tambourine, Florence unfortunately died in 1976 after suffering from a heart attack at the very young age of 32. Definitely not quite the same as Act 1. Tina, it's so... different. The premise of Act 2 is that it takes essences of the Supremes but reshapes them to give the audience a more optimistic ending than perhaps the real story does. You could argue that this was done for legal purposes, as we know they wanted to deviate from the Supremes to cover their backs, but also to perhaps give the audience better closure, or at least a happy ending. Although, on saying that, this was not always the case as one of the original workshop scripts had Effie not return in Act 2, and her death was supposed to be referenced in passing as part of the second act until the original actress, Jennifer Holliday, left the workshop period twice, first for her character dying, and then not being highlighted much in the second act. But now we're halfway through Act 2, and I've had nothing I guess you could also say that Florence and Effie are only the same so much as they were both fired from a rising contemporary trio, and both were very talented and unique musicians. Well, if anything, Effie represents Jennifer Holliday's attitude, perhaps more so than Florence's. Whilst the Dreams and Supremes have their artistic differences, one attempt at aligning Dreamgirls even closer to the truth was made in 2006. In 2006, a lot of the comparison shenanigans from 1981 resurfaced when Paramount announced they were going to be doing a movie adaptation of the musical. The studio screamed from the top of its lungs with giant A4 advertisements that the entire film was fiction, and that any parallels between The Supremes, Barry Gordy and Motown and this movie were just purely coincidental and do not hold any truth. The studio went even so far as to publish an official apology to Barry Gordy after their Oscar campaign for the movie was done, which to me sounds like a lot of cover work for- So, what did the movie do differently? The movie tells the same story but changes details that align more to the story of the Supremes than they take away, such as moving the origin of the Dreamettes from Chicago back to Detroit, which is where the pre-Mets began. And who do you think you are? Diana Ross? My name is Dina, not Diana, and we're the Dreams, not the Supremes, and we're from Detroit, not Detroit. Still, I am nothing like Diana Ross. It also highlights the use of payola and mafia loans more so than the musical does, which allegedly Gordy and Motown were involved with. Not that I really want to get tangled in that part of the conjecture. A scene where they are recording in a studio whilst a riot goes on outside is a nod towards Hitsville, USA remaining open during Detroit's 12th Street Riot in 1967. Also, Curtis wants Dina to become an actress, rather than her desiring to be an actress through her own will, like the musical. I can't play that part. I promised you I was going to make you a movie star, right? I want to be more than an entertainer. I want to be an artist. I want to act. Talking about that movie again. It's so great. It's so this change reflects scenes from the 1975 movie Mahogany, which stars Diana Ross and was directed by, let me guess, uh, Barry Gordy. Making clothes for rich people to look at in the magazine? You think any of this crap means anything to these people around here? It means something to me. The albums are literally the same. Honestly, they didn't even try here, and to say it's fiction, like, okay. Also, a difference that is untrue is that Michelle, aka Cindy Birdsong, is represented as being a secretary turned into a star in the movie, as opposed to being an already established backup vocalist. Jimmy dies off screen from a heroin overdose after being fired from the label, which, because of its odd inclusion, I believe is a nod to the many people who died before their time due to implications caused by drugs and alcohol from the Motown label. Effie's child magic doesn't find out about her father's paternity until the end of the movie. This doesn't happen in the musical, and it potentially reflects Rhonda being told that Gordy was her biological father at the age of 13. It took you a while, though, to tell your daughter that she was... <laughs> his child. His child. Um, no, not really. 
odd for something that's supposed to be fiction to take steps to being closer to the truth, but okay, sure. I think the takeaway from Dream Girls is that it's definitely not complete fiction, unless you're running an advertising campaign, but nor is it completely truthful. It's an artistic view of the Supreme story. To say that it's based on multiple groups or influences is somewhat misplaced when stacked against the evidence of comparison that it has with the Supremes. Other characters may represent or amalgamate to be other people, but this is all within the artistic license that Dreamgirls has taken to tell the Supreme story, even if it's just to protect themselves legally against Motown or for dramatic effect. Additionally, because the Supreme story has elements of contradiction, egocentric opposition and defence to Dreamgirls and personal or professional motives attached to it, it's difficult to truly say if Dreamgirls is false, because even between Mary and Diana they disagree on how the events truly were. I told you to stop calling my house. And with one member of the group unable to speak for herself, it's difficult to truly know what the real consensus was. Mary Wilson's opinion changes like the great British weather and Barry Gordy wrote his own musical which has a less cynical view of the events and, well, Diana Ross refuses to acknowledge the product, though there are rumours that she watched the original production only to storm out of the theatre after Act One. There was a rumour that she had come in, shrouded, dark glasses and sat in the back. Great Broadway urban, you know, myth that she had sat and watched and she wasn't happy. And judging by how far Dreamgirls reached, maybe she had a right to be. I hope you enjoyed Dreamgirls. Um, I most certainly did. I. It's really odd, actually. I went into this video with the intention of actually believing that it was so close to Dreamgirls. I actually felt like Dreamgirls and the Supremes were neck and neck, I suppose. And whilst they kind of are, they're kind of not. So it's, I'm gonna leave that as a statement. My eyes are running. Allergies. Anyone that suffers with allergies. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. Um, so I'll catch you shortly. Thank you for watching and chin chin. There's no tea in there. There was, but now there's not. And that was that.